Carlos. And yeah, I'm really excited to uh, be here. Um, as Carlos said, I'm uh, Pete Warden. Uh, you can reach me at PeteWarden at google.com. Um, one of my goals for this talk is to actually uh, make connections with this community. Um, so I'm hoping um, either to get questions at the end, um, but also feel free to reach out and contact me. And so I feel a little bit like uh, the odd man out when I look at the agenda uh, for today, because when you're thinking about machine learning and when you're talking about machine learning, uh, most of the discussion uh, is usually around things that you can do in data centers, uh, things that you're actually doing on servers, in the cloud, with high performance computing, uh, where you have a whole bunch of uh, data that you've gathered and you're actually doing a bunch of uh, computing on it, uh, like a long way away from where the data was actually gathered. Um, uh, my work is about bringing machine learning into the physical world. Um, and let me just see if I can. I'm actually going to show here uh, in the preview mode since it actually seems to be showing uh, the images. Of course, being a Google software engineer, the uh, Google software is failing me. Um, but uh, if you see this image here, what this is showing is a project that I worked on with a nonprofit called Plant Village, uh, which enabled farmers in the developing world to run a image recognition algorithm that was able to diagnose diseases on cassava plants. And they were actually able to run it locally on their phones because they didn't have data connectivity out in the fields where they were. Um, and it also meant that they were actually able to get very interactive uh, results. Um, and they were actually able to get um, uh, information very, very uh, quickly and easily uh, just running uh, locally on their phones. So all of the work that I've been doing and the TensorFlow Lite and the TensorFlow Lite micro frameworks are focused on is about taking those machine learning algorithms that we know are so useful for analyzing data offline in the cloud space um, and bringing it locally onto devices that are actually in the environment, that are either near users or near the data that's being gathered. And the reason I was really interested in talking to this community is that we see this pattern everywhere where there's way more data that you can gather through sensors, especially unstructured data like microphones or cameras or accelerometers uh, than you can actually send to the cloud. Um, almost all the sensor data that's being gathered is actually just dropped on the floor and the fundamental reason for that is that you can power these sensors for a long time. They use very, very small amounts of power um, just on things like battery power or solar energy. But transmitting that data um, takes uh, orders of magnitude more power. So if you're trying to do something that's going to be deployed in the wild without any kind of uh, person recharging it uh, every day or any kind of mains power, uh, you effectively just can't stream that data uh, if you want things to last for more than a day or two. Um, so you have all this data coming in and then you just can't get it off to the cloud or anywhere else that um, you would expect traditionally to do your processing with it. But if you take that data and you process it locally using machine learning, um, then you end up with 
much smaller, more compact data that you can um, send only when something interesting happens, or you can send, you can store and send much more infrequently, um, and actually keep these uh, sensors um, up and running uh, for a long time just on battery power. And to give you some practical examples, um, here's a project that a colleague of mine uh, worked on uh, that's actually taking camera images and doing a pretty good job of um, predicting uh, particulate uh, levels just from uh, the images uh, that are being uh, taken. And you can imagine, you know, as a person, you can probably look out the window in LA or when we were having the uh, <clears throat> air quality problems in San Francisco from the fires, um, you could look out the window and you could actually probably make a reasonable guess as to what the air quality was going to be uh, just looking at kind of the horizon line. Um, and being able to use uh, deep learning running locally on a device uh, means you can use a device that only has a camera and turn it into this kind of environmental sensor. Um, and so there's some really interesting possibilities when you think about, OK, what are the things that you can actually detect uh, as a person kind of looking out the window uh, about your environment, around things like um, being able to detect uh, precipitation, being able to detect uh, you know, other uh, components of weather, um, even being able to uh, detect things like uh, when uh, plants, particular plants, are actually starting to uh, bloom or are starting to um, you know, sort of uh, sprout based on uh, you know, what's happening with the sort of local climate. Um, so I want to get you thinking about all of these things you could do if you had a camera that was able to kind of make some of those same uh, judgment calls that a person can um, looking at what's happening in the scene. Um, and as another example, um, there's uh, this uh, really interesting project from Rainforest Connection, uh, and it's probably kind of hard to see, uh, but just below uh, the guy's helmet here, he actually has a um, solar-powered, um, what's effectively an old Android phone um, with some solar panels added and put in a, um, a weatherproof box. Um, what he's doing with this uh, is they're working with uh, local communities in the Amazon rainforest um, to help them protect their trees against illegal logging by having this audio device that actually listens out for um, the distinct sounds of somebody with a chainsaw or people with trucks. Um, so it can actually transmit a uh, warning, an alert to the local community that there's this activity happening um, that they're trying to uh, prevent, that they're trying to help protect their environmental resources. Um, and they have this uh, device uh, sitting up in a tree. Um, and they have these sort of scattered around so that you can actually um, help uh, really find um, this stuff happening across a much wider area than you would be able to if you had, um, if you only had sort of people without the technology looking out for this stuff. And what I really want to emphasize is like these previous examples were things that have happened over the last few years that were using um, uh, phones um, and if you saw the uh, the image here, uh, you probably can't see it, but there's quite a large um, set of solar panels and a fairly large device um, that's going up in that tree. So that's uh, you know probably costing uh, you know hundred upwards of a hundred dollars 
to do that, which really limits the number of sensors um, and even thing, you know, even how hard it is to uh, deploy. Um, what's been really interesting is we're starting to get to the point where we can actually run even image processing, computer vision, machine learning models on really small devices like the Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, which costs just uh, $4. And there are similar uh, devices like the Arduinos, uh, ESP32. Um, and as you can see in the illustration, they have a very, very small form factor. Um, so if we were redoing that Rainforest Connection um, detecting chainsaws, for example, uh, these days we might just use something of this size um, and because it's only a few dollars and it's comparatively small uh, and it uses comparatively small amounts of energy, uh, you can uh, have much smaller solar panels or you can have it running on batteries for a much longer period of time than you could with something like a phone. Um, and you can imagine instead of uh, somebody having to repel up a tree uh, to install this device, uh, you can imagine something where it's uh, small enough and cheap enough that you can kind of chuck it up a tree, <laughs> and you know if it if it doesn't quite land right or if it uh, um, you know do, like gets lost, uh, it's much less of a problem than because uh, you have many more of them and they're much smaller and uh, uh, easier to replace. Um, so we've got this whole world of smart sensors um, that you are able to deploy. Um, and one of the other things that has started to be really interesting is if you have existing infrastructure that is really hard to replace, you know, infrastructure things like, uh, this is an example where there's a uh, water meter um, and there's so many analog water meters out there and trying to replace them with uh, connected water meters usually means a whole plumbing job where you actually have to take out uh, the meter, um, you have to replace it with something uh, that's much more modern, you have to uh, give it mains power, you have to have kind of like a you know plumbing skill to be able to put it in place there. Um, what this is doing is it's actually taking an ESP32, a chip that only costs like a few dollars, with a cheap low power camera on it, and it's pointing at the dial and using computer vision to actually read the numbers and the dials off of this device. Um, and then it's actually uh, periodically transmitting uh, the history of that information uh, up to the cloud. So this is uh, a really nice way uh, that's using TensorFlow Lite Micro um, on a device that just costs a few dollars of turning any uh, legacy infrastructure into something that is uh, really um, a lot smarter uh, for way less effort and way less cost than you'd normally have to do to do that. And I'm here because, uh, as I think I mentioned at the start, I'm a massive fan of the work that your, uh, you know, your teams are doing. I think it's incredibly important for everyone um, and has an incredibly high impact. But I don't know your domains. Um, but if you think about the possibilities of these smart sensors, uh, if you think about, uh, I like to think about having an unlimited number of volunteers willing to stand day and night anywhere on the planet, sort of texting you what they're seeing and hearing. Uh, think about what you could do with that. Um, I often also think about it as, you know, the, the ground level complement to satellite data. You have these sensors scattered around uh, an environment and you can have a very, very dense sensor network since they're so cheap and so small. Um, and what I'm hoping is that you'll be inspired by some of these new possibilities that are coming in 
um, and use some of the educational material um, to actually help yourself um, to build some of these um, devices and build some of these solutions that actually solve the problems that you know in your domain. Um, and one of the things uh, that might help you is we do have a free course uh, in collaboration with Harvard about learning how to do this without really assuming any background knowledge of machine learning um, or embedded systems. It's really aimed at uh, people who want to uh, get up to speed on this uh, without uh, a deep background. Um, and there's also some other books and resources you can find uh, through that. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, offline after the uh, uh, talk. Um, I'd love to hear from you uh, if you do start to get into this and start to use it for some of your applications.